Saturday, September the 2nd, the start of the Whitbread Round the World race. The Solent is packed with spectator craft, thousands on the water to bid farewell to 23 yachts about to take on a gruelling nine-month battle against the elements and rival competitors. This is the fifth Whitbread, but the first to be extensively covered by worldwide television. The big breakthrough, hand in hand with big sponsorship, is the presence of onboard video cameras on every yacht. The armchair sailor will now have a true insight into deep ocean racing. This epic race has royal patronage. The Duke and Duchess of York will start the fleet on its way. On board the much-favoured New Zealand catch Fisher and Paykel, you can feel the tension rise as the boats hunt for the best position on the start line. In a stiff breeze, the yachts gather for the big off. Millions of pounds worth of hopes and dreams. Many of these competitors have been planning for years for this very moment. As the fleet powers away, the huge armada of spectator craft crush in around them. The Whitbread crews will have to negotiate a minefield of potential disaster en route to the comparative safety of the open sea. The other New Zealand yacht is the Red Ketch Steinlager II, skippered by Peter Blake, the only man to have entered every race. And for the first time, there's an all-female crew in the race, Maiden, a British entry, but with women from seven different countries. Another first is a Soviet yacht. Fazisi is a radical design from the Black Sea port of Poti. She's skippered by an American, Skip Novak, and like Maiden, she'll steal much of the publicity. The top British entry is Rothmans, a sloop to take on the two New Zealand catches. She's backed by a huge six million pound budget. Unlike the crew on La Poste, the smallest boat in the fleet, crewed entirely by French postal workers, hence the name. The first of the six legs takes the fleet across the equator, through the doldrums and on to Punta del Este in Uruguay, more than 6,000 miles. This race will be like a game of chess, as well as a test of bravery and skill. The yachts cling to each other as they make their way out into the open ocean. Already the onboard cameramen are experimenting with their angles on life. You need more than Gallic flair to go to the top of the mast of a yacht like Charles Jordan of France. Steinlager, meanwhile, has hunted down her first prey, Merritt's the Swiss sloop skippered by Pierre Fellman, known to the Kiwis as Marty. They're delighted to discover their catch has a speed edge. We're fast, he's slow. Marty's got a dog. Steinlager's skipper, Peter Blake, sums up. She must have been eight or ten miles ahead of us uh, a while ago. We've uh, had a knot on her probably all day, or a bit more than a knot. Gone past her. The barometer is dropping slightly, which is a good sign. There's a great big high pressure system in the, uh, the West English Channel. So as long as we keep going south, southeast, we should, south southwest a bit, we should uh, keep a reasonable breeze. So I think it may die a little bit tonight. Off the coast of Portugal the next day, one of the most exciting ocean racing sequences ever captured on camera. Rothmans hard on the heels of Steinlager in near gale conditions. This is a taste of things to come as these great yachts duel across the world's oceans. Steinlager wins this scrap and sets off on a course far west of her main rivals.
On Gatorade, the Italian yacht, the first serious injury of the race. Paolo Caputo has been flung up the mast in an accident during a sail change. He grabbed a fast moving part of the rigging and has ripped his hands to shreds. These terrible wounds will have to be treated several times a day. Serious infection far out at sea must be avoided at all costs. Meanwhile, a pattern of so-called life on board is established. First major structural failure of the race. Fisher and Paykel's mizzenmast collapses after a supporting block exploded. And a crisis on board the Russian Maxi Fazisi. They're running out of water and have to collect rain from the mainsail. Steinlager leads the whole way to Uruguay, her all-powerful progress halted only temporarily by a broken headboard pin one day from port. And Rothmans hits a problem too, very hard. She twists off a wave and the crash opens up a crack in her deck. At night on day 26, Steinlager slips into Punta del Este. She's 11 and a half hours ahead of her nearest rival and covered the 6,200 miles at an average speed of just over 10 knots. Peter Blake collects the Beefeater trophy. In second place is Merritt, arriving in spectacular fashion the next day. But the happiest arrival scenes are those on the card from Sweden. Watch leader Magnus Olsen has become a father during this first leg, and while his son isn't there to greet him, there are at least pictures. Pretty exciting, and I'm very happy. And I saw pictures and I almost broke down. It was too touching. It was nice, really great, fantastic. As for Maiden, well, the women had an unspectacular first leg. They came home third out of five boats in their class. But the celebratory mood is soon shattered. The Russian coast skipper of Fazisi, Alexei Grishenko, commits suicide. Seen here being initiated on crossing the equator, Grishenko hung himself in Punta. To summarise then, in the maxi class, Steinlager wins by around 11 hours from Merritt. Fischer and Peichel takes third, Rothmans fourth. The second leg is the most daunting. From Uruguay right across the Southern Ocean through ice and snow to Fremantle in Australia, 7,650 miles. Leg two gets underway on a bright Uruguayan spring morning. Not so bright for Fisher and Peichel, though. She crosses the line early and has to restart 18 minutes later. Skippers know this leg will sort out the men from the boys. And off the Falklands, Steinlager's the early pacemaker, powering her way towards the frozen wastes of the Southern Ocean. There's the top. No. Is the arrow coming down with this? Yeah. The arrow's disconnected the mast, sir. On Crichton's naturally, there's an early problem that forces the crew back into Punta. A broken cap shroud which costs them several days. The faces on board reflect the frustration. 
especially skipper John Chittenden. Soon the leaders are in true Southern Ocean conditions. I think we're going quite well. If the wind stays like this, I think it's our sort of condition. On Maiden, the women have to cling on for dear life. The cold is numbing. Non-stop freezing conditions, blizzards, the lot. Wherever the crews turn, the elements are savagely against them. On the radar, it's possible to spot most of the icebergs, but not all. The crews are so tired, they run the risk of falling asleep at the wheel. The maiden crew are trying to keep their spirits up, but one of them admits to being scared. You can cope with the water, and that will wash over the boat. But the icebergs, we didn't see the first two on the radar, uh, probably because they were too far away, but we didn't know that at the time. And that was scary, not knowing whether we'd see them on radar. When you're doing 14 knots at night, that is a bit frightening. But the yachts have got what they came for. The fast running conditions in strong winds and big seas are what this lake had promised or threatened. Fortuna of Spain makes good use of the weather, recording a remarkable 400 miles in 24 hours. The boats are under tremendous strain. Sails are ripping all around the fleet. On Rothmans, the spinnaker pole breaks. On Liverpool Enterprise, the boom. On the card, the wheel is buckled. And still, the relentless hostility of the weather continues. The boats are making quick progress, but at what cost? All the time, the crews know that one slip could mean death. both frightening and exhilarating. Unforgettable adventure which leads to more injuries. A cut face on Maiden. Still, there's laughter through the pain. More serious injury on the card where there's a broken arm. And then tragedy. On Crichton's naturally, two men go overboard at night in rough conditions. When Tony Phillips is eventually dragged out by fellow crew members, he's already dead. It rocks the whole fleet. Uh, there was a bent stanchion on the port side, and um, it's a distinct probability that uh, he'd hit that stanchion very hard as he went over the side and was unconscious when he hit the water. The fact that his life jacket hadn't been inflated when we got to him seemed to substantiate that. But the Maxis power on to Fremantle at speeds that have to be experienced to be believed. One, the Australian Army greets the winner in style. Again, it's Steinlager, this time winning by just a few hours from Rothmans and Merritt. They get involved in an incredible match racing duel. At the end of more than seven and a half thousand miles, they're within feet of each other. No quarter asked nor given. And it's Laurie Smith on Rothmans, whose better close quarter experience wins him second place. The walking wounded limp home. There's the broken arm on the card. A busted leg on Fortuna. But marching home in triumph, the women are maiden. 
Against all the odds, they've beaten the men in the longest, toughest leg of the race. For Tracy Edwards, a beef eater trophy. To those who doubted them, the ideal riposte. After two legs, Steinlager increases her lead in the maxi division to 13 hours over merit, then Fisher and Peichel, then Rothmans. Leg three is a comparative sprint from Fremantle to Auckland, a distance of only 3,400 miles. It may be Christmas Eve, but the first few miles of this leg certainly blow the cobwebs away. Back to work with a vengeance for Steinlager, nearly ramming Fisher and Peichel. She has to bear away before things get too close. Both Kiwi crews would give anything to be the first into their home port of Auckland. And here's Fazisi hanging on to the coattails of the card in the most spectacular fashion. Never before have Maxis been filmed in close combat like this. The Soviet yacht with her low freeboard is named the Submarine. It's easy to see why. Such an unseasonal bout of hostility. Grant Dalton, the skipper of Fisher and Peichel, looks like the hunter and the hunted. We're in the uh, first morning. We've been sailing now about 15 hours, 16 hours. And uh, it's pretty tight. We've got the Steinlager just down here. We've made very fast time, averaging uh, probably close to 13 knots since the start. A bit behind us is Rothmans, and then further out to lure of uh, Steinlager is uh, Merritt and um, we're sailing in about 30 to 35 knots, making around about 14 to 15 knots at this present point in time. All over the fleet, there are close calls on Christmas Eve. Maiden is just yards away from with integrity. And then Santa Claus arrives. Christmas Day, it's time to get up. <laughs> this is best Underwear that mom always gives me. This is what I needed some wet socks. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. For some, Christmas dinner is simply biscuits and ham. But for the less serious racers, there's turkey with all the trimmings. Eventually, the celebrations die down and the crews get back to the yacht race in hand. Still thinking of home and loved ones, no doubt. On Christmas Day, the race has a new leader. For the first time, Charles Jordan of France heads the fleet, conditions suiting the lightweight flyer. Second is Fisher and Peichel. Third, Steinlager. Fourth, Rothmans. And fifth, the Spanish boat Fortuna. But the Frenchmen's lead doesn't last long. Steinlager breaks through. The Charles Jordan crew can only watch as the big red catch powers past them. And worse is to come. A whale collides with the French boat, holing it just above the waterline. Skipper Alain Gabet inspects the huge gash in the hull. His crew get on with the repairs. There's more damage on NCB Ireland. They've broken their boom. On Union Bank of Finland, the mast has snapped for no apparent reason in quite calm conditions. The crew are left to salvage what they can from the leg. Meanwhile, the leaders are still slugging it out like championship boxers. Rothmans passes close in front of Merritt. The two sloops seem glued together.
As they reach the northern tip of New Zealand, it's Steinager 2 in front, with the Kiwis' other pride and joy, Fisher and Peichel, only a few hundred yards behind. It's all set for a duel to the finish. Merritt is now heading Rothmans. Will there be a repeat of that thrilling climax to the second leg of Fremantle? Then the weather intervenes. Fisher and Peichel and Rothmans are caught unawares by a vicious squall. Fisher and Peichel loses control of her spinnaker and her battle with Steinlager. Rothmans has to drop a mainsail and concede third place to Merritt. The New Zealand public, though, have got their wish. Their boats one and two into Auckland Harbour and over the line within six minutes of each other. The harbour is packed to greet their national heroes. Peter Blake in particular. The Swiss are third, still second overall. Rothmans steams home fourth. Well, after that, everyone deserves a drink. And Magnus on the card gets to see his son. The gang of four, as they've been dubbed, continue to dominate after three legs. Steinlager from Fischer and Peichel, Merritt and Rothmans. Leg four means a return trip to the perils of the Southern Ocean, plus the rounding of Cape Horn, followed by a long haul back to Punta. Auckland certainly knows how to throw a party on the water. The only problem is that some of the guests are argumentative. The card's mizzenmast gets tangled up with a spectator vessel, and it's mayhem. We were on starboard attack, and we came in through some spectator boats. Uh, one boat, sailboat, anchored. We passed it to windward and cleared uh, our main mast from his mast. But the leeward shroud on the mizzen mast was hooked into the top of his mast, and he has dragged down our mizzen and broke in two places. So the card continues on as a sloop. While others bid a relaxed farewell to the city of Sales, the Swedes work furiously to clear up the debris. The next boat to hit trouble is Ruckenor of Belgium. She turns back to Wellington after hitting a whale. The Belgians had won the first leg prize for Division D and were Maiden's main rivals for class honours, but this destroys their chances of success overall. The damage to their rudder would not have stood the test of the fourth stage. They had to turn back. But after a day's repairs and a night's sleep, they're in the race again. By that time, the leaders are back in the dangerous embrace of the Southern Ocean. In the high latitude, snow can stay on deck for days on end. And there are icebergs, huge icebergs. Really? 
Southern Ocean and we haven't seen one bloody iceberg. Not one. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> Next stop is Cape Horn, that mystical place at the southernmost tip of America. It's been a graveyard for sailing vessels down the centuries. First to round is Steinlager. Fisher and Paykel is second with Rothman's third, the British bulldog barking at the heels of the New Zealanders, hoping for a break. The Charles Jordan crew celebrate. On UBF, their champagne. Three cheers from the card, while the Russians toast the landmark in vodka. On sac quote, British defender one crewman marks the occasion by donning a New Zealand policeman's helmet. But Rothman's hunt for glory is soon at an end. Her boom suddenly snaps. Laurie Smith explains. It was uh, just reaching along and um, then about 35 knots and they just broke straight in half. Took us 36 hours to fix. But uh, once, once we repaired it, it hasn't really slowed us down. Martella's slowed down, she's capsized. The keel fell off the finished boat, leaving the entire crew to scramble onto the upturned hull and await their rescue party. Two rival maxis, Charles Jordan and Merritt. Soon the Finns are safe aboard the Swiss and French yachts and back in the race, leaving their boat to be salvaged later. Meanwhile, those terrible twins, the two New Zealand catches, are neck and neck on the run into Punta. And they hit heavy weather in the last 12 hours of a long, tough leg. On board Steinlager, and Fisher and Paykel in particular, the crews are up to their knees in water just when they thought the worst was over. And when they round the headland into Punta del Este, it's Steinlager and Peter Blake who bring the fleet home. <laughs> <laughs> 